We're here at Bold Rock, and it's a great place to come and reflect what it was like for the early Europeans in the mid 1800s. It was Alan Cunningham who came through here in 1827. And he passed about 50 kilometres west of where we are now. And that's the location of the nearest town, a place called Tenerfield. But we're here to talk about Frederick Ward. And Frederick Ward was a bush ranger, went by the name of Thunderbolt. And we're here to explore Thunderbolt's story. So why don't you join me while we explore another piece of Australia. Frederick Wordsworth Ward. Born in 1835, the youngest child of 10. His parents arrived here as convicts. He'll go to work at a very young age, and in those days that would mean about 12 or 13. And he works in this district in Maitland for about 10 years, and he gets a reputation as a great horseman and a horsebreaker. But it's his nephew, John Garbutt, that lures Ward and other members of his family into his cattle and horse stealing ring. Now Garbutt's done this two or three times before and got away with it, but on this time, they're not so lucky. Garbutt is arrested on the Parramatta train. Ward will be arrested here at Tokel, the station behind me. Now Ward will get 10 years for being in possession of horses that were stolen and that he knew were stolen. Garbutt will also get 10 years and they'll go to jail at Cockatoo Island. They get released in four for good behaviour. John Garbutt goes to the Mudgee district, a place called Coolyale, and he meets an Elizabeth Blackman. She owns a Coolyale Inn and Coolyale Station and a very wealthy lady, and they develop a relationship. When Ward gets released, they employ him as a sto horsebreaker and stockman at their station, and that's where he meets Mary Ann Bug. Now, Mary Ann falls pregnant with his child soon afterwards, but decides that she'd like to have that child with her family at their place near Dungong. So Ward escorts her back, but is relate back to Mudgee for the muster. Now that's against the conditions of his early release, and he'll be sent back to Cockatoo Island to serve out the remainder of his sentence of the six years. But unfortunately for Ward, he compounds his problem. He's arrived back on a stolen horse, so they throw an extra three years on top. It's 1861, and Frederick Ward is back to spend another nine years at Cockatoo Island. In September of 1863, he and another prisoner, Frederick Britton, are working with a work gang on the north side of the island where we're standing. Now they're going to attempt and succeed on doing something no one has ever done before or will ever do again. They're going to escape from Cockatoo Island. And the way they do this is they steal away from the work gang and they hide somewhere for a couple of days. Then they swim across the Parramatta River to Woolwich on the other side. The prison guards find Britain's irons and clothes here on the island, because Ward wasn't in irons, and they also find clothes floating in the water near Woolwich. Now a lady will later testify that a man turned up at her place at Lane Cove, cold and wet, and she provided him with clothes and food before he continued on his way. Soon after Britain and Ward escape, they head straight up to the New England district, where we are now, and they commit their first crime as bushrangers about 10 miles from here, at a shepherd's hut. Now, two or three weeks after that, they're lying in ambush on the mail coach right here at this rock. But they're spotted by a couple of troopers and they challenge Warden Britain, and the shootout erupts between the two. Now, luckily for Warden Britain, they escape, but not before Ward is shot through the back of the left knee. Shortly after that, about two or three weeks, the two will part company. Probably a good idea, much harder to catch two than one. And Ward, he will set back down to Dungog, pick up Mary Ann and the kids, and they're going back into northwest New South Wales, a place they called in those days the lawless northwest. By late 1864, Thunderbolt and Mary Ann are sighted in Burke, and we know he did get that far west. He also went north as far as Warrigo and Queensland, along the eastern ranges, and then from Singleton and Tamworth in the south, a very large area. And his area, way of operating was, he would leave Mary Ann in a bush camp and then raid the local businesses, like inns and station houses and farms, and occasionally a mail coach or a traveller, and then take the proceeds back to Mary Ann at the camp, and then he'd move on. 
But he reached his top of his crime spree in 1865 when he formed his first gang, but that was quickly disbanded when John Thompson was shot and caught near Moree. The second gang was formed, but again, it disbanded soon after when one of the gang members shoots a policeman. The third gang was almost formed when the notorious bushranger and outlaw, John Dunn, was looking to catch up with Thunderbolt. But unfortunately for Dunn, the police would catch up with him and Burke first. By 1866 and 67, he'd taken on some young accomplices and he became such a pest to Queensland and New South Wales police that they'd combined forces and put a 400 pound pound bounty on his head. But by 1867, his relationship with Mary Ann was over as well. But he didn't realise that she was pregnant for his youngest child, Frederick Wordsworth Ward, his namesake. And he would be born in 1868 and Thunderbolt knew nothing of this. Thunderbolt also went into a bit of a hiding after that and he wouldn't surface for more than a handful of times until that fateful day in 1870. And this is one of the caves that Thunderbolt used to come and hide out in. And we're up in the northern part of New South Wales, not very far from the Queensland border, on the edge of the Great Dividing Range. But how did Thunderbolt know these caves were here? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. We know he was married to an Aboriginal lady, Mary Ann Buck, and he spent a lot of time with her before he took up the life of crime. And there's a possibility he came up here with Mary Ann and her people, and they showed him where these caves were, because they've been using for thousands of years. The other possibility is he was a very skilled bushman and he learnt some of those skills from living with the Aboriginals. So he could have came up here and explored and found these caves for himself. But one thing's for sure, when the police down south got an interest in Thunderbolt more than he was comfortable with, he'd retreat up here and hide out until things cooled off down south. It's 1870 and it's seven years after Thunderbolt got in a shootout with police at this very location. But he's back and he's been holding up passing travellers on the New England Highway and he's been doing it all day. And he holds up an Italian immigrant, Giovanni Pasacotti. But Pasacotti's heading south, so Thunderbolt lets him go. He thinks nothing more of it. But Giovanni's doubled back to the north to Urala and he's alerted the Urala police that there's a man holding up the passing travellers near Blanche's Tavern. Blanche's Tavern is just the other side of this rock. Thunderbolt has been holding up travellers near this rock all day, but now he's down at Blanche's Tavern having a few drinks. He's totally unaware that the troopers are galloping in from Urala, about five kilometres from here. The first trooper is about 500 metres in front of the second, and he arrives here, dismounts, and has an exchange of fire with Thunderbolt, who's down at Blanche's Tavern in that gully. The second trooper arrives, and he goes to charge down there to confront Thunderbolt. Now it appears at the time that Thunderbolt may have considered coming up and charging towards the police, but for reasons we don't understand, and that possibly he had an accomplice, he changes his mind, and he takes off across the paddock, across the bush, with the second constable in hot pursuit. That's Constable Walker. There's an exchange of shots as Walker pursues Thunderbolt. Now Thunderbolt's on a zigzag course through the bush. He's trying to lose Walker, but Walker's constantly gaining on him. And they do this for about 15 to 30 minutes until they get to a place called Kentucky Creek, which is actually only two kilometers from Blanche's Tavern. It's not that far. Now this is where Thunderbolt almost gets away with it. He jumps into the creek. He dismounts and jumps into the creek. And Walker comes up behind him. Now this is where Walker could easily have lost him. But Walker shows some initiative and real intelligence. He shoots Thunderbolt's horse and then he ducks down the creek, finds a narrower crossing and comes up the other side to cut off Thunderbolt. But Thunderbolt sees this happening and he doubles back and now he's on the same side of the creek as he started with Walker on the other side. They have an exchange of conversation which I'll try to repeat to you as best I can. Thunderbolt yells out to Walker. He says, who are you? And Thunderbolt and Walker responds, never you mind. Thunderbolt then yells out, are you a trooper? No response from Walker. He yells out, are you married? And Walker yells back, yes. And Thunderbolt says, well, why don't you go home? And Walker says, I can't do that. So he says, well, let it be the best man then. And Walker said, let it be. And then Walker charges into the water on horseback, but his horse flounders in the water. 
and Thunderbolt seizes the opportunity and jumps into the water as well. But Walker lets off one single shot and it hits Thunderbolt in the chest and goes straight through his heart. Now Walker, Thunderbolt is thrashing around in his death throes and tries to pull Walker off his horse and Walker hits him with the butt of his pistol. It probably wasn't required, Thunderbolt is dead. Alexander Binning Walker will be the man who brings Thunderbolt down.